God is dead. Or so it must have seemed to the ages of the Jews in 586 AD. Jerusalem and the temple to their God are aimless. The nation of Israel, founded by King David, is wiped out. It would have to have been the end, but it was rather the beginning. For out of the temple of destruction emerges a sacred book, the Bible, and an idea that will change the world, belief in one God. This is a new idea. It was an idea that nobody had ever had before. Monism is well ensconced, so something major happened, which is very hard to trace. Now, a provo new story from discoveries deep within the earth and the Bible. We wanted to examine the possibility that the remains of King David's palace are here. We can actually see vivid evidence here of a destruction. Question number one, who did it? An archaeological detect story puzzles to their clues to the mystery of who wrote Bible, when, and why. And it was very clear it was some kind of tiny scroll. Immediately saw very clear, very distinct letters. This is the ancestor of the Hebrew script. And from out of the earth, thousands of idols suggest God had a wife. Who just found this exceptional figurine show the fertility goddess. Powerful evidence drew light on how one people, alone among ancient cultures, finally turned their back on Isaac to find one God. This makes the God of ancient Israel the universal God of the world that resonates with people, at least in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim tradition to this very day. Now, Science and scripture converge to create a powerful new story of an ancient people, God, and the Bible. Up next on Nova, the Bible's buried secrets. Funding for NOVA is provided by the following. One of the biggest challenges for geoscientists is trying to find the oil and gas that's hidden below the surface of the Earth. Lately, our researchers have developed a new technology called R3M. You can't see it and you can't feel it, but the Earth has electromagnetic waves. And if you build the right kinds of listening devices, you can make sense of those waves. So using those tools, we can supply more of the energy that we need with less of an impact on the environment. And David H. Koch. And... Discovering new knowledge. HHMI. Major funding for the Bible's buried secrets is provided by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Fund, and the Righteous Persons Foundation. Additional funding for this program is provided by the Skirball Foundation and by the Solo Art and Architecture Foundation. Major funding for NOVA is also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by PBS viewers like you. Thank you. Near the banks of the Nile in southern Egypt in 1896, British geologist Flinders Petrie excavation in Thebes the ancient city of the dead. Here he unearths one of the important discoveries in biblical archaeology. Beneath the sand appears the corner of a royal monument carved in stone.
dedicated in honor of Pharaoh Merneptah, son of Ramses the Great. It became known as the Merneptah Stela. Today, it is in the Cairo Museum. This stela is what the Egyptians would have called a triumph stela, a victory stop, commemorating victory over four peoples. Most of the hieroglyphic inscription celebrates Merneptah's triumph over Libya, enemy to the west. But almost as an afterthought, he mentions his conquest of people to the east in just two lines. The text reads, Ashkelon has been brought captive. Gezer has taken captive. Yenoam in the north Jordan Valley has been seized. Israel has been born. Its seed longer exists. History proved Pharaoh's confident boast to be wrong. Rather than marking their annihilation, Merneptah's stela announces the entrance onto the world stage of a people named Israel. This is priceless evidence for the presence of an ethnical group called Trail in the central lands of southern Canaan. The well-established Egyptian chronology gives the date as 1208 BC. Merneptah's stela is powerful at a people called the Israelites are living in Canaan. Day includes Israel and Palestine over 3,000 years ago. The Israelites are best known for their stories that chronicle their Abraham and Moses and the Ten Commandments, David and Goliath. It is the Israelites who write the Bible. Through writing the Hebrew Bible, the beliefs of the ancient Israelites survived to become Judaism, one of the world's oldest continuously practiced religions. And it is the Jews who give the world an astounding belief in one God. This belief will become the foundation of two other great monotheistic religions, Christianity and Islam. Often called the Old Testament, from the New Testament, which describes the event early Christianity. Today, the Hebrew Bible and a belief in one God are woven into the fabric of world culture. But in ancient times, people from the Egyptian to the Greek to the Babylonians worshipped many gods, usually in the form of us. How did the Israelites, own among ancient people, discover the concept of one God? How did they come up with an idea that so profoundly changed the world? Now, archaeologists and biblical scholars are arriving at a new synthesis that promises to reveal not only fresh historical insights, but a deeper meaning the authors of the Bible wanted to convey. They start by digging into the and the Bible. You cannot afford to ignore a biblical text, especially if you can isolate a kind of kernel of truth behind these stories, and then you have archaeological data. Now, what happens when ten artifacts seem to point in the same direction? Then I think we're on a very sound ground historically. Scholars search for intersections between science and scripture. The earliest is the victory stela of the Egyptian pharaoh Merneptah from 1208 BC. Both the stela and the Bible place a people called the Israelites in the hill country of Canaan, which includes modern-day Israel and Palestine. It is here between two of his greatest empires that Israel will unfold. 
the way to understand Israel's relationship to the superpowers, Egypt and Mesopotamia on either side, is to understand its own sense of fragility as a people. The primary in which the Bible looks at origins of Israel is the people coming to settle land of Israel. It's not indigenous, it's not a native state. The Hebrew Bible is stories of Israel's origins. The first is Abraham, who leaves Mesopotamia's family and journeys to the promised land, Canaan. Lord said to Abraham, Forth from your native land and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. This is 12, 1 and 2. According to the Bible, this promise establishes the covenant, a sacred contract between God and Abraham. To mark the covenant, Abraham and all males are circumcised. His descendants will be God's chosen people. They will be fruitful, multiply, and inhabit all the land between Egypt and Mesopotamia. In return, Abraham and his people, who will become the Israelites, must worship a single God. This is a new idea. It's an idea that nobody had ever had before. God, in our sense, doesn't exist before Abraham. It is hard to appreciate today how rad an idea this must have been, a world dominated by polytheism worship of many god idols. The Abraham narrative is part of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, along with Noah and the flood and Adam and Eve. Though they powerful message, to date, no archaeology or text side of the Bible to corrupt them. The farther back you go in text, the more difficult it is to find historical material in it. The patriarchs go back to Genesis. Genesis is, for the most part, uh, a compilation of myths, creation stories, uh, things like that. And find a historical core there is very difficult. This absence of historical evidence leads scholars to a different approach reading the biblical narrative. They look beyond our modern notion of fact or fiction to ask why the Bible was written in the first place. There is no word for history in the Hebrew Bible. The biblical writer telling stories. They were good historians, and they could draw the way it was when they wanted to, but their objective was always something far beyond that. So what was their objective? To find out, scholars must uncover who wrote the Bible and when. And the Lord said to Moses, write down words. For in accord with these words, I'm in and with you and with Israel. Exodus 4, 27. The traditional belief is that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, the story of creation. Exodus, deliverance from slavery to the promised land. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, laws of morality and observance. Still read to this day, together they form the Torah, called the Five Books of Moses. The view that Moses had personally written down the first five books of the Bible was virtually challenged until the 17th century. There were a few questions raised about this. For example, the very end of the last book of Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, discussed the death and burial of Moses. And so some rabbis said, well, Moses couldn't have written those words himself because he was dead and being buried. And digging deeper into the text, there are even more discrepancies. For example, any of each species of animal is supposed to bring into the ark. One text says two, a pair of kind of animal. Another text says seven pair of the animals and only two of the unanimals. In one chapter, the flood lasts for 40 days and forts. 
but in the it's 150 days. To see if waters have subsided, Ma sends out a dove. But in the previous sentence, he sends a raven. There are two complete versions of the flood story interwoven on the same page. Many similar discrepancies throughout its page suggest that the Bible has more than one writer. In from the first five books of the Bible, scholars have identified hand of at least four different groups of scribes writing over several hundred years. The theory is called the documentary hypothesis. One way of thinking about it is a kind of anthology that was made over the course of many centuries by different people adding to it, subtracting from it, and so forth. But when process of writing the Bible begin? Tel Zayit is a small southwestern border of ancient Israel that dates back to biblical times. Since 1999, Rafi has been excavating here. It was the last day of what had been a typical season. As I was taking aerial photographs from the cherry picker, a volunteer notified his square supervisor that he thought he had seen some interesting marks, scratches, possibly letters, uh, incised in a stone. Which, right here, yeah. Letters would be a rare find. So when he kneeled to look at Taffy, the surprise of a lifetime. And down over the stone, I immediately saw very clear, very letters. Taffy excavated the rock and brought it to his lab at the nearby kibbutz. It was then that he realized he had more than a simple inscription. Olive, bait. I realized that this inscription represented an ABC theory. That is to say, not a text okay. narrative, but the letter of the Semitic alphabet Mem. written in their correct order. None. And then pay and are difficult to read, but they're out here. This ancient script is an early form Hebrew alphabet. What was found was not a random scratching of two or three letters. It was, it was the full alphabet. Everything about it says that this is the ancestor of the Hebrew script. The Tel Zayit ABC theory is the earliest Hebrew alphabet ever discovered. It dates to about 1000 BC, making it possible that writing the Hebrew Bible could have already stopped by this time. Discover the most ancient text in the Bible, scholars and the Hebrew spelling, grammar, vocabulary. The Hebrew Bible is a collection of literature written over about a thousand years. And as with any other language, he naturally changed quite a bit over the thousand years. The same would be true of English. I'm speaking English of the 21st century, and if I were living in Elizabethan times, the words I choose, the syntax I use, would be quite different. Scholars examine the Bible in its original Hebrew in search of the most archaic language, and therefore the passages. They find it in Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. His picked officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Exodus 15, 4. This passage, known as Song of the Sea, is the climactic scene of Exodus, the story of the Israelites' enslavement in how Moses leads them to him. In all of the Bible, no single event is mentioned more times than the Exodus. With the development of ancient Hebrew script, the Song of the Sea could have been written by 1000 BC, the time of Tappy's alphabet. 
but it was probably recited as a poem long before the beginning of Hebrew writing. It's very likely that it was a kind of story told in poetic form that you might tell around the campfire. Just as our poems are easier to remember generally than prose accounts, so we, we generally think that the, uh, the poetry is uh, orally passed on from one to another long before they commit things to writing. Because the poetry in Exodus is so ancient, is it possible the story has some historical core? Here in the eastern Nile Delta of Egypt, in a surreal landscape, fallen monuments and tumbled masonry, archaeologists have uncovered a lost city. Inscribed on monuments throughout the site is the name of Ramses II, one of the most powerful Egyptian rulers. It is Ramses who is traditionally known as the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Ancient Egyptian texts call the city Pyramesi, or of Ramses, a name that resonates with the biblical of Exodus. The only specific item mentioned in the Exodus story that we can probably connect with non-biblical burial is the cities that the Hebrews were ordered to build, and they are the Pithom and Ramses. Scholars agree that the biblical city is the ancient Egypti, Pyramesi. Its ruins are here in present-day Tanis. Most of the Egyptologists identified Pyramese, the Ramses town, with Tanis, because here you have an abundance of Ramesite monuments. This convergence in archaeology and the Bible provides a time frame for the Exodus. It could not have happened before Ramses became king around 1275 BC. And it could not have happened after 1208 BC when the stela of Pharaoh Merneptah, Ramses II's son, specifically locates the Israelites in Canaan. The Bible says the Israelites leave Egypt in a mass migrate, 600,000 and their families and then in the desert for 40 years. Even assuming Bible is exaggerating, in a hundred years of archaeologists have not yet found evidence of migration that can be linked to this. No excavate gives us any information of Rao the wandering of the wilderness. An exodus is, is simply not attested anywhere. Any historical or archaeological confirmation of the ex remains elusive. Yet scholars have discovered all four groups of biblical contributed to part of the Exodus story. So it is for the same reason message remains powerful to this day. Its inspiring theme of freedom is a compelling notion and that is one that we can understand the story of the Exodus from being controlled by others to controlling oneself. The idea of a change from domination to autonomy, that these are very powerful ideas that resonate in the human spirit. And the Exodus gives narrative reality to those ideas. Following the Exodus, the Bible says God finally delivers the Israelites to the Promised Land, Canaan. Archaeology and sword side the Bible reveal that Canaan consisted of well fortified city states, each with its own king, turn served Egypt and its family. The Canaanites, a thriving Near Eastern culture for thousands of years, worshipped many gods in the form of idols. The Bible describes a new leader, Joshua, takes the Israelites into Canaan in a blitzkrieg military campaign. So shouted, and the trumpets on. 
As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, they raised a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. Joshua 20. But what does archaeology say? In the 1930s, British archaeologist John Garstang excavated at Jericho, the first Canaanite city in Joshua's campaign. Garstang uncovered dramatic evidence of destruction and declared he had found the very walls that Joshua had brought tumbling down. And at what the Bible describes as the greatest of all Canaanite cities, Hatzor, there is more evidence of destruction. Today, Hatzor is excavated by one of the leading the archaeologists, Amnon ben Tor, and his protege director, Sharon Zuckerman. I'm walking through a passage between two of the rooms of the Canaanite palace of kings of Hatzor. Of the destruction, you can see almost everywhere. You can see the dark ones here, and most importantly, how they cracked into pieces. It takes tremendous heat to cause such damage. The fire here, no, I should say, the mother of fire. Among the ashes, Ben Tor discovered a desecrated statue, most likely the king or patron god of Hatsur. Its head and hands are cut off, apparently, by the city's conqueror. This marked the Canaanite Hazor. Question number one, who did? Who was a, who is a possible candidate? So number one, we don't mention having done anything at Hazor. Any of the inscriptions of the time, we don't so. Another city-state could have done it. Maybe it was strong enough to do it. Who are we left with? The Israelites. The only ones about whom there is tradition that they did it. So, let's say be considered guilty of this of Hatzor until proven innocent. And there's another Canaanite city that Joshua and his army Israelites are credited with laying waste. Called Ai, and has been dis in what is now the Palestinian territory of this bank. Here, Archaeologist Harel Dean and his team are find evidence of a rich Canaanite culture. The village first appears and developed to a city, and then there was a kind of fortification surrounding this settlement. These heaps of stones were once a magnificent palace and temples, which were eventually destroyed. But when the archaeologists date the destruction, they discover it occurred about 2200 BC. They date the destruction of Jericho to 1500 BC, and Hatzor's to about 1250 BC. Clearly, these city-states were not destroyed at the same time. They range over nearly a thousand years. In fact, of the one sites the Bible says that Joshua conquered, few showed any sign of war. There was no evidence of a conflict in most of these sites. At the same time, it was discovered that most of the large Canaanite towns that were supposed to have been destroyed by these Israelites were not destroyed at all, or destroyed by others. A single sweeping militant invasion led by Ja cannot account for how the Israel arrived in Canaan. But the destruction of Hatzor does coincide with the time that the Merneptah Stila locates the Israelites in Nin. So who destroyed Hatzor? Amnon ben still believes it was the Israelites who destroyed the city. But his co-director, Sharon Herman, has a different time. The final design itself consists of the mutilation of statues of kings and gods. 
It did not consist of signs of war or of any kind of fighting. We don't see weapons in the street like we see other sites that were destroyed by foreigners. So if there was no invasion, what happened? Bobby, just uh, be careful with the stones there, okay? Excavations reveal that Hatsor had a lower city of commoners, serfs and slaves, and an upper city with a king and wealthy elites. Zuckerman finds within the grand palaces of elite Hatsor air disrepair and abandonment. To archaeologists, signs of a culture in decline and rebellion from within. I would not out the possibility of a final revolt of Canaan living at Hatsor and uh, against the elites that uh, rule the city. In fact, the entire Canaan city state system, including Hat and Jericho, breaks down. Archaeology and ancients clearly show it is the result of a long period of decline and upheaval that sweeps through Mesopotamia, the Aegean region, and the Egyptian empire around 1200 BC. And when the dust, as it were, settles, when we can begin to see what takes the place of these, of this great state system, we find a number of new peoples suddenly coming into focus in a kind of void that is created with the dissolution of the great state system. Archaeologists find the Israelites among these new people. In the 1970s, Archaeologists started wide-ranging surveys throughout the hill country of Canaan, today primarily the Pinion territory of the West Bank. I was teaching at that time. We used to students and go twice a week to the highland. And every week we used to cover between two and three square kilometers. And uh, this uh, accumulates very slowly into the coverage of the area. Israel Finkelstein and teams of archaeologists walked out grids over areas, collecting every fragment of ancient pottery lying on the surface. Over seven years, for nearly 400 square miles, sorting pottery and marking the locations of where it was found map. In the beginning, the spots were there on the map and they meant nothing to me. But slowly, slowly, I started seeing sort of phenomena and processes. By dating the pottery, Finkelstein discovered that before 1200 BC, there were approximately 25 settlements. He estimated the total population of those settlements to be three to 5,000 inhabitants. But just 200 years later, there's a very sharp increase in settlements and people. Then you get this boom of population growing and growing. Then we are speaking about 250 sites. And the population grows also 10 times, from a few thousand to 45,000 or so. Now, this is very dramatic. It cannot be explained as natural growth. People, at this rate is possible in ancient times. If not natural growth, perhaps these are the waves of dispersed people settling down following the collapse of the great state systems. Then, more evidence of a new culture is discovered. A new type of simple dwelling never seen before. And it's in the exact location where both the Merneptah Stila and the Bible place the Israelites. The sites in which this type of house appears throughout the country, this is where Israelites lived. 
and they are sometimes even called the Israelite house, the Israelite type house. But the people who lived in those villages seem to be arranged more or less in a kind of an egalitarian society because there are no major architectural installations. If you look at the fine, finds are relatively poor. It is more or less mundane. I don't want to end the early settlers or the Israelites. Very little art. Curiously, the mundane pottery found at these new Israelites is very similar to the every pottery found at the older Canaanite cities like Hatzor. In fact, the Israelite house is practically the only thing that is different. Broad similarity is leading archaeologists to a startling new conclusion about the origins of the ancient Israelites. The notion is that the early Israelites were Canaanites, displaced Canaanites. The Israelites were all in the land of Israel. They were natives, but were different kinds of groups. They were basically the have-nots. So what we're dealing with, a movement of peoples, but an invasion of armies from outside, but rather a socioeconomic revolution. Ancients describe how the Egyptians and their Canaanite vassal kings burdened the lower class of Canaan with taxes and even slavery. A radical new theory based on archaeology suggests what happens next. As that oppressive social system declines, families and tribes of serfs, slaves, and common Canaanites seize the opportunity. In search of a better life, they abandon the old city-states and head for the hill. Free from the end of their past, they eventually emerge in a place as a people. The Israelites. A text, you have a story of the Israelites coming from outside and then besieging uh, Canaanite cities, destroying and then becoming a nation uh, in the land of Canaan. From the Middle Bronze Age. Whereas archaeology tells us something which is the opposite. According to archaeology, the rise of Israel is an out of the collapse of cat society, not the reason of collapse. Archaeology reveals Israelites were themselves originally Canaanites. So why does the bond consistently cast the Israelites as outsiders in Canaan? Abraham's wanderings from Mesopotamia. Moses leading slaves out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. And Joshua conquering Canaan from outside. The answer may be their desire to forge a distinctly new identity. Identity is created, as psychologists tell us, by talking about what you are not, by talking about another. In order to figure out who I am, I figure out who I am not. Conspicuously absent from Israelite villages are the grand palaces and the extravagant pottery associated with the king's rich elites of Canaan. The Israelites did not like Canaanite system, and they defined themselves in contrast to that system. So by not using white pottery, by not using import pottery, they developed an ideology of simplicity, which marked the difference between them and the Egyptian Canaanite system. If the Israelites wanted to distinguish themselves from their Canaanite past, what better way than to create a story about destroying them? But the stories of Abraham, Exodus, and the conquest serve another purpose. They celebrate the power the Bible says is the foremost distinction between the Israelites and all other people, their God.
In later Judaism, name of God is considered so great, it is never to be spoken. We don't know exactly what it means. We don't know how it was pronounced. But it seems to have been the personal name of the God of Israel. So his title, in a sense, God, and his name was four letters, which in English would be Y-H-W-H, which we think were probably pronounced something like Y. But Yahweh only appears in the Hebrew Bible. His name is nowhere to be found in Canaanic texts or story. So the Israelites find their God. The search for the origins of Yahweh leads scholars back to ancient Egypt. Here in the royal city of Karnak, for over a thousand years, pharaohs celebrated their power with statues, obelisks, and carved murals on temple walls. Here on the north wall of the Karnak, we have scenes depicting the victories in battle of Seti I, the father of Ramses the Great. Seti here commemorates one of his greatest victories over the Shasu. The Shasu were a people who lived in the deserts of southern Canaan, now Jordan, northern Saudi Arabia. And around the same time, the Israelites emerged. Egyptian texts say the places where the Shasu lived is called IHW, probably pronounced Yahu, likely the name of their patron god. That name Yahu is strangely similar to Yahweh, the name of the Israelite god. In the Bible, the place where the Shasu lived is referred to as Idian. It is here, before the Exodus, the Bible tells us Moses first encountered Yahweh in the form of a burning book. Come no close. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Exodus 3, 5 and 15. So we have in Egyptian sources something that appears to be a name like Yahweh in the vicinity of Midian. Here is Moses in Midian, and there a deity appears to him and reveals his name to Moses as Yahweh. These tantalizing connections are leading biblical scholars to re-examine the Exodus story. While there is no evidence to support a mass migration, some now believe that a small group did escape from Egypt. However, they were not Israelites, but were Canaanite slaves. On their journey back to Canaan, they passed through Midian, where they are inspired by stories of the Shasu's god, Yahu. There was probably a group of people who fled from Egypt and had some divine experience. It was probably small, a small group uh, demographically, but it was uh, important, at least uh, in ideology. They find their way to the central hill country, where they encounter the tribes of the Canaanite city-states. Their story of Dils resonates in this immoralitarian society. The liberated slaves attribute their freedom to the god they met in Midian, who they now call Yahweh. They spread the word to the Highlanders, who themselves perhaps escaped from the tyranny of the King City States. They spread the idea of a god who represented freedom, freedom for people to keep the fruits of their own labor. 
This was a message that was so powerful that it brought people together and gave them a new kind of identity. The identity of Israelites. They are a combination of disenfranchised Canaanites, runaway slaves from Egypt, and even nomads settling down. The Bible calls them a mixed multitude. According to the Hebrew Bible, early Israel was a motley crew, and we know that's the case now. But these people bound together by a, a new vision. And I think the revolutionary spirit is probably there from the beginning. The chosen people may actually be people who chose to be free. Their story of escape first told by word of mouth and poetry, helps forge a collective identity among the tribes. Later, when written down, it will become a central theme of the Bible. X and divine deliverance. Deliverance by a God comes from men exactly where the Bible is. Adopted by the Ites to represent their ex from slavery to freedom. So the birth of monotheism. The common ending of what differentiated the Israelite from their neighbors was that their neighbors worshipped many different gods and goddesses, and the Israelites worshipped only the one true God. But that is the case. This bull figurine, we representing El, the chief god of the Canaanite deities, is one of thousands of idols discovered in Israelite sites. The Israelites fully worshipped other gods. Now, maybe they were supposed to, but they did. So, at least on a practical level, if not most Israelites were not monotheists. The Bible's ideal Israelite worship of one god will have to wait. About two centuries pass after the Merneptah Stila places the Israelites in Canaan. Families grow into tribes. Their population increases. Then about 1 BC, one of Bible's larger-than-life figures emerges like the 12 tribes of Israel, a powerful new enemy. If it put his hand into the bag, he took out a stone and slung it struck the king in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, fell down on the ground. 1 Samuel 17. 4. The Bible celebrates David as a shepherd boy, vanquishes the giant Goliath, a lover who lusts after forbidden fruit, and a poet who poses lyric psalms still recite A. Of all the names in the Hebrew Bible, None appears from David. Scriptures say David creates a kingdom that strays from Egypt to Mesopotamia. He makes Jerusalem his capital. And through covenant, Yahweh promised he and his descendants will rule forever. David's son son builds the temple where Yahweh, now the national god of it, will dwell for thee. The kingdom of David and Solomon, one nation united under one God, according to the Bible. Now, some skeptics today have argued there was no such thing as a united monarchy. It's a later biblical construct, and particularly a construct of modern scholarship. In short, there was no David. As one of the biblical revisions said, David is more historical than King Arthur. But then, in 1993, an amazing discovery literally shed new light on what the Bible's ancient Israel's greatest king. Gila Cook was fitting up some survey work, an assistant at Tel Dan, a biblical site in the far north of Israel today. The excavation was headed by the eminent Israeli archaeologist Avraham Biran. It was near the end of the day. Cook was getting her last moments okay. 
she hears a yell from below. And it was Biran and his booming voice yelling, Gia, let's go. And so I waved to him, hold it, and continued working. Okay. After being summoned by Biran a second time, Cook had her assistant load her up. And she started down the hill. So I get there and I just drag and drop the board and I set my stuff down. But something catches her eye. A stone with what appeared to be random scratches, but was actually an ancient inscription. This time, she yelled for Biran. And he looks at it and hit me and he says, Oh my God. Cook had found a fragment of a victory stealer, written in Aramaic, an ancient language very similar to Hebrew. Dedicated by the king of Damascus, or one of his generals, it celebrates the conquest of Israel, boasting, I slew kings who harnessed thousands of riots and thousands of horsemen. I killed them of the David. Those words, that David, make this a critical discovery. They are strong evidence that David really lived. Unlike Genesis, the stories of Israel's kings move the biblical narrative out of the realm of legend to the light of history. The later we come in time, the firmer ground we stand on. We have better sources, we have more written sources, we have more contemporary eyewitness sources. When the biblical chronology of Israel's kings can be cross-referenced with historical inscriptions, Michael Dan Stila can provide scholars with fairly reliable dates. King David is the earliest biblical figure confirmed by archaeology to be historical. And most scholars agree he lived around 1000 BC, the 10th century. Could any of the Bible have been written during David's reign? The earliest Hebrew alphabet, the Skaran Tati, carved on a stone at Tel Zait, provides an enticing clue. This wall here. The stone was inside with this alphabet. The stone was used to build a wall. And the structure itself suffered massive destruction by fire sometime near the end of the 10th century BCE. The find is even more significant because Tel Eit was a biblical backwater, the fringes of David's kingdom. Surely, if there was a scribe right this alphabet that far away, out in the boondocks at the extreme western boundary of the kingdom, surely if there was a scribe that could do that out there, there were scribes, much more sophisticated scribes, back in the capital. Could these scribes have been in the court of King David and his son Solomon? Could they have been the earliest local writers? In the 18th century, Germans uncovered a clue to who wrote the book, hidden in two different names for... According to one account, Abraham knew God by his intimate personal name, Convention announced Yahweh. Passages with the name Yahweh, which in German is spelled with a J, is referred to as J. But according to other accounts, Abraham knew God simply by the most common Hebrew word for God, which is Elohim. So the different writers became known as E for Elohim and J for Yahweh. Most likely based on poetry and songs passed down generations, they bought a version of Israel's distanced stories of Abraham in the Promised Land, Moses, and the Exodus. The earliest of these sources is the one that is known as J, which many scholars dated to the 10th century BC, the time of David and Solomon. And because the backdrop for J's version of events is the area around Jerusalem, it's likely he lived there perhaps in the royal courts of David and Solomon.
For over a hundred years, archaeologists have searched Jerusalem for evidence of the Kingdom of David. But excavating here is contentious because Jerusalem is sacred to today's three monotheistic religions. For Christians, Jesus comes in his final week to worship at the Jerusalem temple. He's crucified, he's buried, he's resurrected in the city of Jerusalem. For Islam, it is the site where Muhammad comes in a sacred night journey. And today, the Dome of the Rock marks that spot. In Judaism, the stories of the Hebrew Bible, of Solomon, of David, of the temples of Jerusalem, all these take place, of course, in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a symbol of sacred space today, important for all three traditions. Despite the difficulties, Israeli archaeologist Elahar went digging an ancient part of Jerusalem, today called the City of David. We started the excavations here because we wanted uh, to check uh, and to examine the possibility that the remains of David's palace are here. But because this area has been fought over, destroyed, and rebuilt over thousands of years, it was a long shot that any old remains would survive. But then... Large walls started to appear, three meter wide, five meter wide, and then we saw that it goes all direction. It goes from east, 30 meter to the west, and we don't see the end of it yet. Such huge walls can only be part of a massive building. And Mazar believes her excavations to date represent only 20% of its total size. huge structure shows centralization and capability of, of construction. It can be royal structure. This huge complex may be evidence of a kingdom, but is it David's kingdom? For this to be Dave's palace, it would have to date to his lifetime around 1000 BC. The problem stone walls can never be dated on own. Biblical archaeologists date ruins based on the pottery they find associated with those ruins. Pottery dating on two ideas. Pottery styles evolve only over time. And the further down you, the further back in time you go. If pottery style A comes from the lowest stratum, then it is earlier than pottery style B that comes from the stratum above it. By analyzing it from well stratified sites, excavators are able to create what called a relative chronology. Chronology is floating in time without any fixed dates. To anchor this chronology, William Foxwell Albright considered the father of biblical archaeology, used events mentioned in both the Bible and Egyptian and Mesopotamia texts to assign to pottery styles. Albright's chronology, slightly modified, is what Mazar uses to date her massive building, and most archaeologists use today. What we found is a typical 10th century pottery, meaning bowls with hand burnish. You can see from inside, together with an import, a beautiful black on red juglet. What is so important that this is a 10th century typical juglet. So has Mazar discovered the Palace of David? She adds up the evidence. The building is huge. It is located to the 10th century beast, the time of Mar believes she has indeed found the palace of David. Right. 
That evidence and the kingdom itself rest on the dates associated with fragments of pottery. And some could argue the system for dating that pottery relies too heavily on the Bible. Archaeologists in the past did not rely too heavily on the Bible. They relied only on the Bible. We have a problem in dating. How do you date in archaeology? You need an outside. Today, there is a more scientific method to anchor pottery firm dates. Radiocarbon dating. It is a study of Elisabetta Boreto of the White Institute. The fact is, of course, in the field which relates this sample, the material like uh, olive pits or seeds uh, or charcoal to the archaeological context. If an olive seed is found at the same layer as a piece of pottery, then the seed can be used to date the pottery. When the seed dies, its radioactive carbon-14 decays into stable carbon at a consistent rate for time. By measuring the ratio of carbon-15 to carbon-12, Do can determine the age of the olive, which in turn can be date the pottery. Loreto has meticulously collected and analyzed hundreds of samples from over 20 throughout Israel. Her carbon samples date the pottery that Albright and most archaeologists associate with the time of Dave Solomon to around 75 years later. For so long ago, this may seem like a difference. But if Pareto is right, the Tsar's palace of and Pappy's Hebrew alphabet have to be redated. This places them in the time of the lesser-known kings Omri, Ahab, and his despised wife Jezebel, all worshippers of the Canaanite god Baal. No writing or monumental building. Suddenly, the King David and Solomon is far less glorious than Bible describes. So Solomon did not rule over a big territory. It was a small chimum, if you wish, with just a few settlements, very poor, the population was dead, there was no manpower for big conquests, and so on and so forth. This would make De a petty warlord ruling over a chieftain, and his royal cow Jerusalem nothing more than a cow town. These are the results of the radiocarbon dating. He or she who decide to ignore those results, I treat them as if arguing that the world is flat, that the earth is flat. I cannot argue anymore. But so simple. Other teams collected radiocarbon samples following the same calculus methodology. According to their the Tsar's Pantapi's alphabet can date to the 10th century, the time of David and Solomon. How can this discrepancy be explained? The problem is that these radiocarbon dates have a margin of error of plus or minus 30 years about the difference between the two sides. Pottery or carbon dating alone cannot determine if the kingdom of Nin Solomon, large and prosperous as described in the Bible. Fortunately, the Bible offers clues of other places to dig for evidence of this kingdom. The Bible credits David with conquering the kingdom. But it is Solomon, his son, who is the great builder. What was the purpose of the forced labor Solomon imposed? It was to build the house of Yahweh and the wall of Jerusalem, Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. 1 Kings 9.15 Here in Hathor, Amnon ben Tor, director of excavations, believes this may be evidence of Solomon's building campaign. Archaeologists call it a six-chambered gate, 
massive entryway fortified with towers and guardrooms. Bentor's predecessor, Yadin, first uncovered this structure. It turned out to be a six-chambered gate, and uh, Yadin immediately remembered that a very, very similar gate was excavated at there, and Chicago University excavated this gate at Megiddo. Stunned by the study of these three gates, he recalled the passage in the Bible. Here we have a wonderful connection of Pickle Passage as it up in archaeology. Three monumental gates, all the same pan, would seem to be evidence not only of prosperity, but also of a central authority. Through history, the Israelites had been into tribes, then into kingdoms, nor health. The locations of these striking their gates in both regions suggest a single governing authority throughout the land. How can we be sure this is the kingdom of David and Solomon? The answer once again lies in Egypt. The head smiting scene which you see on this wall commemorates a campaign conducted by Pharaoh Shek or Sheshonk, founder of Dynasty 22 in Egypt. The Egyptian Pharaoh Shishak invades Israel, an event the Bible reports and specifically dates to five years after Solomon's death, during the reign of his son Rehoboam. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, King Sheshak of Egypt marched against Jerusalem and carried off the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the royal palace. He carried off everything. 1 Kings 14, 25 and 26. The importance of this in fixing one of the earliest dates, specific dates, in which Egyptian history coincides with biblical history is, is really startling and has to be taken note of. This stunning converging in the Bible and Egyptian history firm date the death of Solomon. Shishak's campaign, according to the well-established Egyptian chronology, dates to 925 BC. And the Bible says Solomon dies five years earlier, which means 930 BC. This is further evidence that David and Solomon lived in the 10th century. But there's even more hidden in these walls. These ovals, with their depictions of bound cat and city walls, replaces Pharaoh Shishak conquered in Israel. One of those places is Gezer, where archaeologists find the hallmark of Solomon's building program, a six-chambered gate. Bill Deaver directed the excavations in the late 1960s. We actually see vivid evidence here of a destruction. Down below, we have the original stones pretty much in situ. But if you look in here, you, the stones are badly cracked. You can even see where they're burned from the heat of a huge fire that has been built here. And then up there, you see the fire has been so intense that the soft limestone has melted into lime and it flows down like lava. This is vivid as of a destruction, and we connect that with this known raid of Pharaoh Shisha. And if the gate was destroyed by Shishak in 925 BC, then it must have been built during the lifetime of Solomon, who died just five years earlier. Surely this kind of monumental architecture is evidence of state formation. And if it's a century, then Solomon. Although a mine of archaeologists continue to dis this convergence of the Bible, Egyptian chronology, and Solomon's gates is powerful evidence that a great kingdom existed at the time of David and Solomon, spanning all Israel north and south with its capital in Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is more than a politiker. It is the center of worship. The magic of Jerusalem is the magic of the temple. 
one temple for the one God. The result is that Jerusalem and the temple right, emerge as powerful symbols, not just of the oneness of God, but of the oneness of Jewish people. The worship of the ancient Israel bears little resemblance to Judaism today. It's centered around the temple, built by David's son Solomon, and seen as Yahweh's earthly dwelling. To understand how the ancient Israelites worshipped their God, scholars must discover what the temple looked like and how it fit. But although archaeologists know where its remains should be, it is impossible to dig there. It lies under the third holiest site in Islam, which includes the Dome of the Rock. Not a stone of Solomon temple has ever been excavated. But the Bible offers a remarkably detailed description. The house which Solomon built for Yahweh was 6 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. In the inner sanctuary made two cherubim, in cubits high. He the cherubim with gold. Kings 6, 2, 20, and 28. The Bible's description suggests a floor plan for some temple. And it is strikingly similar to temples built by neighboring peoples who were many gods. Closest in appearance is a temple hundreds of miles to the north of Jerusalem at Ain Dara in modern day Asia. They have similar dimensions and the same basic floor plan. Guarding both temples are sphinxes or cherubim, as the Bible calls them. Unique to the temple at Ain Dara are the enormous footprints of the God who lived here. They mark his progress as he strode to his throne in the innermost sanctuary. If we take the details that we find of Solomon in the book of Kings and compare it with the Ain Dara temple, we can piece together a fairly good picture, I think, of what this temple uh, might have looked like in the age of Solomon. Now it is possible to react with some confidence how Solomon's temple made it and how the ancient Israel worshiped God. Out front was an altar. Beyond that was a porch area that led into the inside of the temple. It's a room, a holy place. And then beyond that, the most sacred room, the Holy of Holies, where tradition says the Ark of the Covenant held the tablets of the law. And this was considered to be the most sacred site on earth because it is the room where present could be found. And the ancient Israelites believed their God and a very specific worship. Evidence of it survives today on Erezim in Palestine. The Samaritans who claim direct descent of ancient tribes of Israel. According to their tradition, for over 25 years, they have practicing the ancient Israelite form of worship. Animal sex. Primary function is make a connection between our mundane world and the divine world. And the mean for the ancient Israel is embodied in blood. Blood is the most sacred sense on the altar. And blood is the sense that embodies life. This is the most precious substance in the human world. But while the priests were all sacrificed to Yahweh in the temple, many Israelites were not as loyal. At Tel Rehov, archaeologists are digging at an Israelite house that illuminates the religious practices of its inhabitants. Well, we just found this beautiful, exceptional 
clay figurine showing a goddess, a fertility goddess, that was worshipped here in Israel. His case, she's shown holding a baby. Who is this fertility goddess? And what is an idol doing in a light home? Dramatic evidence as to her possibility first surfaced in 1960. Bill Deer was carrying out salvage ejections in tombs in southern Israel when a local brought him an instrument that had been robbed from one of them. When I got home and brushed it off, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Executed in the clear 8th century, it's a tomb inscription. And uh, it gives the name of the deceased, and it says, Blessed may X be by Yahweh. That's good biblical Hebrew. It says by Yahweh, and it's Asherah. And Asherah is the name of the old Canaanite mother goddess. More inscriptions associating Yahweh and Asherah covered. And thousands of figurines unearthed throughout Israel. Scholars believe this is the face of Asherah. Deaver concludes, God had a wife. Even years after the Israelites robbed their Canaanite pagan roots, monotheism is still not completely taken hold. This is awkward for some people, the notion that, that Israelite religion was not exclusively monotheistic, but we know now it wasn't. The Bible admits the Israelites continue to worship Asherah and other night gods, such as Baal. In fact, the prophets, holy men speaking in the name of God, consistently rail against breaking the covenant made with Moses to worship only Yahweh. For I called them the more from me, they sacrificing to the Baals, offering immense to idols. Hosea 11, 2. The Israelites had made a contract with God. If they kept it, God would reward them. If they broke it, he would punish them. He would punish them by using foreign powers as his instruments. Events seemed to fulfill the prophet's dire predictions. Soon after Solomon's death, the ten northern tribes fell and formed the kingdom of Israel. Then a powerful new storms out of Mesopotamia to create the largest and the Near East had ever known, the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the overpowering military force, and Israel and Judah, the two states that the Bible talks about as the state making up the people Israel, fell on its way of the Assyrian juggernaut. Numerous Assyrian texts and reliefs vividly document their domination of Israel and Judah. In 72 BC, the Assyrian army crushes the northern kingdom. Those who escape death or exile to Assyria flood south into Jerusalem, where the descendants of David and Solomon continue to reign. One of them, Josiah, according to the Bible, finally heeds what the prophets prescribe. We're told in the book of Kings that King Josiah in the late 7th century BC was told that a scroll had been discovered in the archives. The scroll brought to him, and as this was being read, Josiah began to weep. He realized that it was a sacred text containing divine commands which the people had been breaking. Scholars believe that the lost scroll is the fifth book of the Torah, Deuteronomy, detailed code of laws and events. It inspires another scribes in 7th century BC, which scholars call the Deers. A core documentary hypothesis, after J and E, e is the third group of scribes who write part of the Hebrew Bible. D retells the Exodus story, and reaffirms the covenant made between God and the Israelites. You should love the Lord your God because He has loved you. He has loved you more than any other nation. So the divine love for Israel requires 
a corresponding loyalty to God, an exclusive loyalty to God. And Deuteronomy, more than other parts of the Bible, is insistent that only the God of Israel is to be worshipped. To enforce the covenant, Josiah orders that idol altars to all other deities be destroyed. The book of Deuteronomy contains the clearest prohibition of the worship of other gods, the Ten Commandments. I am a your God. You shall have no other good before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them or worship. Deuteronomy 8, 6 through 9. The Ten Commandments appear in two books of the Bible, in Deuteronomy and in Exodus. It is not only a contract with Yahweh, it is also a code of conduct between people. The revelation of the Ten Commandments is a, an ethical revelation. And that's where the idea of justice comes in, because that's the most important thing about the way in which we treat one another. We will not kill him. We will not steal from him. We will not lie about him. We will abide by the commandments. The commandments, as God himself repeatedly says through the, pro the later prophets, are already written on the hearts of human beings. By assuming the belief in one God with behavior, the Ten Commandments establishes a code of morality and justice for all, the ideal of Western civilization. Despite Josiah's reforms, the ancient Israelites continued to worship other gods. Their acceptance of one God and the triumph of monotheism begins with a series of events vividly attested through archaeology, ancient texts, and the Bible. It starts with the action of Yahweh's earthly dwelling, the Jerusalem Temple. In 586 BC, after defeating the Assyrian, a new Mesopotamian are invade Israel. The Babylonians sack the temple and systematically burn the sacred city. Before his eyes, the Babylonian victors slay the sons of Zedekiah, the last Davidic king, then blind him. The covenant thus made that his dynasty would rule bro. After 400 years, Israel is wiped out. The destruction of Jerusalem created one of the most significant theological crises in the history of the Jewish people. The Babylonians round up the Israelite prophets and scribes and drag them in chains to Babylon. Babel records confirm the presence of Israelites, including the king, in exile. In every age of disbelief, one is inclined to think God is dead. And surely those who survived the fall of Jerusalem must have thought so. After all, how could God allow his temple, his house, the sign, visible sign of his presence among his people to be destroyed? Without temple, king, or land, how can the Israelite live? Their journey begins with the eight rolls, which scholars speculate were viewed from the flames of the destruction. Among the exiles from Jerusalem to Babylon were priests from the temple. And they seem to have brought with them their sacred documents, their sacred traditions. According to the widely accepted doctrine hypothesis, here in Babylon, far from their homes in Israel, that priests' scribes will produce the Hebrew Bible as it is known to Scholars refer to these writers P, or the Holy Source. It was P who took all of these earlier traditions, the J source, the E source, the D source, and other sources as well, and combined them into know as the Torah, five books of the Bible. But more than just compiling, he edits and writes a version of Israel's distant past, including the Abraham story, 
that provides a way for the Israelites to remain a people and maintain their covenant with God. You shall circumcise the flesh of foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Genesis 17, 11. When Genesis 17 attributes a covenantal value of circumcision, it is not really talking about Abraham. It is really talking about the exiles of 6th century BCE, who, far from their native home, were desperately trying to find a way to reaffirm their difference. Therefore, they began to add circumcision as not simply their practice, but rather as the marker of it, and attributed this view to Abraham. To the exiles, the Babylonians are the new Canaanites, the idol being uncircumcised peoples from whom they must remain apart. But the Abrahams with its harrowing tale, father's willingness to sacrifice his own son is all about the power of faith. It is no coincidence that the exile scribes place Abraham Jins in Ur, down the river from Babylon. Perhaps with the same faith as Abraham, so too the exiles be written to the promised land. One of the pervasive themes in the is the theme of exile and return. Abraham goes down to Egypt and comes out of Egypt. The Israelites go to Egypt and get out. For the exile in Babylon in the 6th century BC, that theme must have resonated very powerfully. God, who had acted on their behalf in the past, presumably do so again. Israelites still have a problem. How, in a foreign land, without the temple and sacks, can they redeem themselves in the eyes of Yahweh? To assure that divine protection, the patron emphasizes observances such as the Sabbath observance. You don't be in the land of Israel, keep the Sabbath. And we have allusions in the biblical writing of the prophets to the fact that the exiles all learned to pray in, group in what was to become the forerunner, the synagogue. Shema Israel. During this period, through the exile, that the exile realized that even far away from their homeland, without a temple, without the priesthood, without kings, they're still able to worship God, be loyal to God, and to God's commandment. This is the foundation of duty. The experience of the exile transforms ancient Israel into modern religion. By compiling the story of their past, originally written by the scribe A, E, and D, the exodus from slavery to freedom, Moses and the Ten Commandments, Abraham's journey to the prompt, he creates, we know today, first five books of the Bible. Though this theory is widely accepted, physical evidence of any biblics from the exile or earlier are hard to come by. The most celebrated surviving biblical text are the Dead Sea Scrolls. First covered by accident in 1907, this represent nearly all 39 of the Hebrew Bible, at least in fragments. survived because they were deposited in the perfect environment for present, the hot eye desert. Archaeologists suspect there were at least hundreds more scrolls throughout Israel, but because of non-papyrus or animals, they have long since decoosed. Even though the earliest of the Dead Sea Scrolls date to the third and second centuries BC, that doesn't mean they're the first copies or example this work that were ever written means that they already stand line of tradition that had been established uh, by the time the scroll were written mm -hmm. 
Still, the earliest of the Dead Sea Scrolls dates to at least 300 years after the Babylonian exile. In the absence of proof of earlier text, some scholars claim the entire Bible is pious fiction and even doubt whether Israel and the Israelites ever existed. For many of the revisionists, these extreme skeptics, there was no ancient Israel. Israel is an intellectual construct. In other words, these people were not rethinking their past, they were inventing their past. They had no past. So the Bible is a myth, foundation myth, told to legitimate a people who have no legitimacy. The legitimacy of the Israelite past is on finding a piece of evidence to prove the ancient origins of the Bible. What would be the discovery of a lifetime starts outside the wall of Jerusalem in an old cemetery. We came here and excavated seven of these burial caves. Uh, the burial caves date back to the 7th century BC, somewhere in the time of King Josiah. But the caves were found looted, so we didn't anticipate too much. Gabriel Arkan instructed a 10-year-old volunteer to a tomb for photographs. Instead of that, he was born, he was alone, and he had a hammer, and he began banging the floor. But the floor turned out to be a hole in the ceiling. Beneath it were artifacts that had escaped the looters. Among the hundreds of graves, one act stood out. It looked like a cigarette butt. It was cylindrical, about an inch in size, about half an inch in diameter, and it was very clear it's made of silver. It was some kind of a tiny scroll. A second smaller scroll was also found, and both were taken to the Lady Israel Museum. But unraveling the scrolls to see if they contain a read option could risk destroying them completely. Andy Vaughn was one of the epigraphers on the project. Archaeology is basically a destructive science. In order to learn anything, you have to destroy what's there. Gabriel Bracay and his team had to make a decision. Does one unroll these amulets does one preserve them? They decided that it was worth the risk, and Hind would tell us that they could not have been wrecked. Through painting conservation, Christians devised a special method for unrolling the skulls and revealing their contents. I went over there and I was amazed to see a whole thing full of uh, very delicately scratched, very shallow uh, characters. The first word that I could decipher already spot was Hud Hey Vav Hey, was the four letter unpronounceable name. investigation revealed more text and a surprisingly familiar prayer still said in synagogues and churches to this day may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace numbers 6 24 through 26 There is no doubt at all that these two amulets contain the priestly benediction found in number six. These inscriptions are thus very important because they're the earliest references we have to the written biblical narratives. The archaeological context was very clear because it was found to get pottery dating to the seventh century BC. Also, the paleography, the shape of letters, points towards uh, somewhere in the 7th century BC, beyond any doubt. The silver scrolls with the priestly benediction predate the earliest Dead Sea Scrolls by 400 years. It is an amazing find proving that at least some verses of the Bible were written in ancient times during the reign of King David's descendants. By giving us texts from before the Babylonian exile, 
the Silver Scrolls confirm that the Hebrew Bible is created from poetry, oral traditions, and prayers that go back to the time of Josiah's D writer, and likely beyond to writers E and J. As modern scholars suspect, the Torah, the first five of the Bible, take final form during the Babylonian exile. But dwarfed by the mighty temples and giant use of Babylonian gods, the Israelites must also confront the fun question, why did their god, Yahweh, forsake them? In the ancient world, if your country was destroyed by another country, it that their gods were powerful than your god. And the natural thing to do was to worship the powerful god. But the survivors continued to worship Yahweh and struggled to understand how this could have happened. They resort first to a standard form of explanation, which is found elsewhere in the ancient Near East. We must have done something wrong to incur the wrath of our God. It's out of this that comes the reflection that polytheism was our downfall. There is, after all, only God. The Israelites end in the folly of theism. Monotheism triumphs, and the archaeological evidence proves it. Before the addition of the first temple, wherever we dig, in whatever part of the Judean country, we sanctuaries and more we find hundreds and thousands of figurines in Jerusalem itself. But after the destruction, there are none. We are speaking about thousands in before, nothing, completely nothing all after. Monotheism is well and firmly in God. So something major happened, which is very hard to trace. But that was searing experience that the exile. The experience of the exile, writing the Bible, the concept of God as it is known today is born. In a way, peak was something that was much greater because it was greater than any individual land or kingdom. It was it's a kind of of a universal religion based on a creator, not a, just a god of a single nation, the god of the world, the god of the universe. This moves Yahweh into the realm of being a universal deity who has the power to affect what happens in the whole universe. This makes the god of ancient Israel the universal god of the, of the world that resonates with people, at least in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim tradition to this very day. In 539 BC, the Babylonian Empire is toppled by the Persians. As written in the Bible, Yahweh, in his new role an invisible God, illustrates a new exodus. <laughs> Among one group of exile is prophet Ezra. Back in Jerusalem, he gave a public reading of the newly written Torah. He established the covenant. All the people gathered together. They told the scribe Ezra the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. He read from it from early morning until midday, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Nehemiah 8, 1. To me, the most moving moments in the Bible. Ezra turns with the Bible in his hand. We have the feeling that the process begun in the exile is finally finished, and Ezra has a copy. The scrolls that chronicle the Israelite relationship with their God is now the He Bible, the Old Testament, a text for over three billion people. Through its writing, an ancient becomes a modern religion. And the Israelite Yahweh transforms into the god of the three great monotheistic religions. Through readings, the Bible established a code of morality and justice, aspirate that resonate through the ages. More fact or fiction, the intersection of science and scriptures is a story that began over 3,000 years ago and continues to this day.
On Nova's Bibles Buried Secrets website, share your thoughts on the program, ask questions of biblical scholars, explore a timeline of archaeology, and more. Find it at pbs.org.